James Hunt, who won there in 1977, won't be with us. But in his memory, this tribute to a great Grand Prix driver and a wonderful commentating colleague. Cross gets away well, so does Hill, so does Schumacher. And Wendlinger is coming up well. Brilliant start by the Austrian driver in the Black Sauber. Prost leads, Hill second, Wendlinger is third, and Ayrton Senna is up to fourth position ahead of Schumacher, and challenging Wendlinger as they go round the right-hander into the old hairpin. Senna is up to third. And after being crowded at the start, a quite brilliant couple of corners by Ayrton Senna. Tremendous stuff. He muscled his way back into the contention of Redgate. He's going inside David Hill. For 16 weekends a year, for the last 13 years, from Australia to Brazil to Mexico, South Africa, America and the whole of Europe, that was how closely James and I used to work together. And because of that, we got to know each other pretty well. And I very rapidly discovered that James was a very special sort of person. He didn't think the way other people do. He certainly didn't act the way other people do. And he was always a very exciting, stimulating, and fun, unpredictable, but very authoritative person to be with. In fact, it was very obvious to anybody from his very earliest days that whatever James chose to do in later life, he was going to make a success of it. James Hunt holding the flag up for Britain, driving a superb race in far off Japan, and James Hunt is going to win the World Championship. Very much the public schoolboy, James was educated in the magnificent surroundings of Wellington College, where he excelled at ball games. But watching a club race at Silverstone whetted his appetite for motor racing. With his good looks and charm, and the fact that it was all fun to him, James was no drab conformist, always the centre of attraction. But under his devil-may-care manner, he was deadly serious about getting to the top. The glamour and trappings of success were to come later, though. It was in Formula 3 that his career started to take off. And James Hunt is through. Hunt is up into second place now, ahead of Trimmer. Trimmer, who was second, has been pushed down to third position by James Hunt, number 21, from Sutton, 23 years old. He's been driving for three years, and here he is in the Red Lotus. At circuits like Crystal Palace, James's forceful driving attracted the attention of no less a man than Lord Alexander Hesketh, who recruited James to his unique Formula One team. Hesketh Racing is a team that is made up of rule breakers, and the fact that we've managed to break some of the rules and get away with it, not the rules written in a book, but the unwritten rules, that you can never come into Formula One unless you have a completely professional team, that you can never come into Formula One with a driver who has a reputation only for crashing cars, that you can never come into Formula One with a team manager who's an ex-used car dealer, that you can never come into Formula One with a rich young man who knows nothing about it, that you can never come into Formula One with a whole lot of mechanics that no other racing team would hire. I think we've, we've proved something by that. I think that the enthusiasm we have in the team makes up for an awful lot that we lack in professionalism. How did they start? How did they begin? Hesketh Racing are going to win. We're all human beings, and if one remembers that fact, we all start with the same physical advantages and or handicaps, and therefore there's no, there's no reason on paper why they should be better, apart from their advantage and experience. Oh, driver we keep in clothing and meals, as long as he goes on turning his wheels. His name is James Hunt, known as the Shunt. What he likes best is a nice glass of milk. The much derided Hesketh team made their mark in 1973. The next year they had their own car and James was a spectacular winner at Silverstone's non-championship international trophy. And Hunt going through. James Hunt takes the lead at Woodcote in an absolutely superb manoeuvre. My goodness, that was a consummate bit of motor racing artistry, the like of which I have seldom seen before. Indeed it was. Hesketh and Hunt, the fun team with the teddy bear mascot, had elatedly arrived. Thank you. Thank you. 
Come on. Well done. Congratulations. You had to do it the hard way. I didn't. The gear shift came off. Okay. Sorry about that. The clutch went on behind and then the gear lever came off on that too. Really tremendous. They say the first win is always the hardest, but now it really was the big time. 1975, a genuine shot at the World Championship. Second in the Argentine and sixth in Brazil. But round seven in Holland was sensational. In the gleaming white Hesketh Ford, James drove a race of sheer brilliance to win his first Formula One victory against the might of the twin Ferraris of Nicky Lauda and Clay Regazzoni. The amateurs had beaten the professionals. Sheer enthusiasm had defeated massive budgets. 18 years later, Lord Hesketh, now government chief whip in the House of Lords, remembers it all vividly. One of the things about James was that he had huge support from the British racing public. And we always went to a lot of trouble with our supporters. We, we used to make great effort with them. And I remember riding around on the, on the truck after that we'd won. And Zandvoort's a pretty gloomy place. It's just a lot of sand dunes. And on top of every sand dune were these just waves, waves, and waves of Union Jacks. And it was a wonderful feeling to feel that those people who traveled all the way around Europe and had seen frustration after frustration finally saw the result that they wanted. And uh, even today, which is 18 years later, it still gives me goose pimples. Now, adored by the nation and partnered by beautiful women, fun-loving James Hunt was a superstar. Lauda was world champion for Ferrari in 1975 and aimed to make it two in a row the next year. But now he was up against James Hunt driving for McLaren after a depleted wallet had forced Alexander Hesketh out of Formula One. James and Nicky were rivals but always liked and respected each other. I remember very well in 1976 I had my accident I couldn't race for three races but James was pressing on all through the year and I must say today that the McLaren he was driving was not as competitive as my Ferrari. And in the end, he did beat me by one point at the Japanese Grand Prix for the championship. So from my point of view, James was an incredible personality because you could see him with the people on the street talking, low key maybe, and you could even put him on the table with the Queen of England. He would always know how to behave. For me, he was the most charismatic personalities ever been in Formula One. With four wins for Lauda's Scarlet Ferrari in the first eight races, 1976 looked a lost cause for James and McLaren, although the Spanish race had seen a second superb Grand Prix win for the Englishman at Harama, in spite of initially being disqualified for a technical infringement. James stood on the top step of the rostrum in front of King Juan Carlos, one step above Lauda. Six races later, at the Nürburgring in Germany, Lauda nearly died as a hideous fire engulfed his Ferrari. Amazingly, a badly scarred Nicky was back three races later in Italy for an almost unbelievably heroic fourth place and three vital points. James won the next race in Canada and the following round 15 at Watkins Glen in America. Lauda was third and now the chips were really down for the vital last race in Japan with a confident Nicky leading the championship by a mere three points and trying to outsight James. At quarter to eight in the morning when I was still asleep there was a great banging on the interconnecting door of my room so I went and opened it and there was Nicky already in his overalls marching into my room and saying Morning, I'm going to be the world champion today. <laughs> In the early morning hours, Britain excitedly turned on the TV for pictures from Japan. Despite appalling weather, they looked great as James took control. And it's James Hunt who takes the lead in the Japanese Grand Prix with fellow Brit John Watson trying to overtake him as they swoop round the right-handers. Hunt leads 
from the thing and fifth uh, or sixth is Nicky Lauda. To win the championship, James had to finish at least three points ahead of Lauda. And on lap three, it looked as though he had them. Nicky's Ferrari was in the pits and the Austrian was getting out of it. It's madness to race in these conditions, he said, and walked away with James still in the lead. Villa jobbing in range. Ron Villa trying to get past James Hunt. Hunter's got the line. Ron Villa trying on the other side. Ron Villa's going through and Hunter's left. Ron Villa. No, he hasn't let him pass. Side by side, Ron Villa up and Ron Villa spins. And he missed Hunt by inches. This is what James Hunt must have been afraid of. But the drama continued. In came James with a puncture, down to fifth when he needed fourth. Louder could only watch and hope but James finished third for the vital four points he needed. He was world champion of 1976 when he arrived home at Heathrow. James inspired a lot of drivers uh, and a lot of uh, young people in the early 70s. And I can uh, remember watching him actually win the, uh, the championship in Suzuka when he just got those vital points when Nicky Lauda uh, retired from the race. Um, just fantastic. and. Uh, I mean, I'm in shock really today because I think you'll agree any 45-year-old to pass over uh, at that age is just um, astounding. He was always capable of uh, uh, embarrassing somebody with his attitude or, or a joke. Um, he was not... Uh, very interested about other people's opinion. Uh, he, he believed very much in at his own values and his own reasons. And um, whether they were sometimes making people uncomfortable or not uh, was not a problem for him. I think even in fact sometimes he was even capable of going too far, even for himself, just to, 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 to let people more uncomfort, uncomfortable with him. But uh, it was his nature, his character, and, um, and I like him. I like him the way he was. He, he was an incredibly... Uh uh, contradictory man in so many different ways and his lifestyle was to say the least uh, maverick uh, as a racing driver uh, he was also quite unconventional and uh, you know his mode of code of dress was something that took everybody by surprise and sometimes shock uh, while he was becoming world champion he had already become uh, quite extreme in some of his habits uh, and, and that was one of his charms in a way because James Hunt was always his own man and, and I'm, because of his public school education because he was very well educated very well spoken and articulate with a great command of the English language one assumed that all of those other things he was fully aware of the fact that if he arrived in a, in a sort of well-soiled t-shirt in a rally jacket uh, with a pair of sort of well-used jeans and maybe not even socks, for sure no socks, and sometimes with sandals and sometimes without shoes, uh, that he knew that what he was doing. And the conventional sponsors, governing bodies, um, motor racing people uh, would have expected a slightly different code of dress for those circumstances. James must have been aware of it, did not care. It was James Hunt. He made his statement. And he lived with it. <laughs> He's at James Hunt's house. Oh, yeah. Champagne, anybody? <laughs> Everybody wanted James, and he reveled in it. Oh. 
Oh, don't go over there. That's all right. That's all right. That'll kick left. That'll kick left. That's all right. But James was still a racer. Two more years with McLaren brought three more wins. In 1979, he joined the Wolf team. With failure at Monaco after 92 Grand Prix and 10 wins, his racing career was over. I stuck it out this long because I've been trying very hard and we've been looking for light at the end of the tunnel, myself and the team. We've done a lot of testing to try and improve the car. And uh, basically now it, it appears evident that without short of building a new car for which there isn't time or getting another one, uh, all of which possibilities we've examined and found impossible, uh, I don't really stand a chance of winning a race this year. And, uh, at, at that, on that basis, for me, the risk is too great and to drive for sixth place. I'm, I'm interested in driving to win, um, but, but, no, but not, not more than that. So unfortunately, I felt that with the, with the danger and things, I've had to knock it on the head. Time to start a new career, exploiting his knowledge and experience of Grand Prix racing and his natural flair with words, talking about the sport that had brought him fame and fortune. He was one of the commentators that I truly enjoyed listening to. Uh, the combination of Murray Walker and James Hunt really were, it was quite extraordinary, really. It, they were totally opposites. Uh, and yet, James's contribution was always to the point, extremely critical, controversial, um, in some cases incredibly uh, 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 pointed towards a driver's inabilities, while at the same time always uh, very complimentary when the time was right for James and his view to say it. And there's a lot of grey commentators who, who never quite get to say what they feel they would like to say or dare say and, and sometimes say it off camera but won't say it on camera. That was not, that was not James Hunt. Here is race leader Nigel Mansell, he comes up alongside and takes to the Alio, they clip each other and that's where Alio went off yesterday. Yes, and Mansell was very lucky to not be taken off by that ridiculous piece of driving by Alio, who didn't even look at his mirrors, he didn't even know Mansell was there, and uh, the man who crashes at every Grand Prix anyway. Because of Alio, he's done himself crashes. great credit in this race to have, to have lasted as far as he did, and quite honestly that must really put his career in, uh, in very serious doubt because... After 13 years of enthralling viewers with his wit and wisdom, James Hunt's absence will fill the worldwide followers of Formula One with sadness, just as his two fine young sons will grieve for the loss of a loving father and Grand Prix paddocks will miss his jovial presence. You know, there are lots of people who can talk about Grand Prix racing, but the only one, in my experience, who's been able to do it the way James did was James himself. Because no one else, in my experience, has had his unique combination of talents. The knowledge of how to do the job, the success at having done it, the ability to talk about it, the ability to predict, and to be able to do it with provocation and good humor in a way that was absolutely unique to him. I know that all over the world, millions and millions of people who have been watching Grand Prix racing over the years and enjoying everything that he had to say are going to feel very much the poorer as a result of the fact that he's no longer with us to say it. It's left an enormous hole in my life and I, <clears throat> I really am going to miss him very much indeed.